Good morning, all heart church. Hey, can we get up on our feet today? Can we worship the living God? His name is Jesus. You guys ready? I'm excited. Here we go. Come on, let's put our hands together just like this. I've seen you do it before. I believe you can. And I know you care. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard for you. And I know you care. There is no other, nobody greater than you. Come on, with every hand in here, just like this. We say, I know you care. today. Hey, God has been good. Come on, Jesse, turn up on the drums. Here we go, church. Set. Every hand up just like this. Oh, say Jesus, Jesus, say Jesus, oh Jesus, say Jesus. God is good. Yes, he is. It's not a cliche phrase either. Can I, can I share something with you guys this morning? Are you guys awake? Oh, yes, I love that. Thank you for being awake. I was sharing with the guys earlier that I wanted to break in the song, which wasn't planned, but I wanted to break in the song. And I uh, read something this week that that really kind of caught my attention, and I felt like God had me go back to it, and so I wrote it down. And I believe that God wants to speak this today. And um, I think we come here so many times, I think wanting something from God, needing something from God. And we always share that in this moment, the Bible says and promises that God's, we're in God's presence, that God's presence is here, that God's presence that he inhabits the praise of his people, which means he sits here with us, he enjoys the worship, he sings over us, he sings with us, he dances with us. That's what's happening right now, even though you don't see it. And so I, I came to Deuteronomy this past week because it's kind of where I've been. Deuteronomy 4.31. 
And I want to share it with you because I think somebody in this room needs to hear it. Whether you're online in your home or whether you're here, I believe that God's spirit is in us. And sometimes you got to coach your soul, right? You got to coach your alma in Spanish. And so the spirit is a little bit different. The spirit is perfect. The spirit is holy. The spirit is in you if you got Jesus in you. And so if you're at home, you don't got to not say I'm not in the presence of God. You are in the presence of God because the spirit of Jesus is in you. Amen? Come on, let's hear it. Amen? Yeah. Let me share this with you. It's so good. It's Moses, right? There's a little bit of context. People come out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. And Moses begins to remind the people, and he says, verse 31, he will not leave you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them by oath, because the Lord your God is a compassionate God. Let me read 30, because it gets better. Let's go back. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, you will return to the Lord your God in later days and obey him. He will not leave you, destroy you, or forget the covenant. The other promise in the Bible is that God would not leave you nor forsake you. This next song is called With You, and there's a phrase. There's a phrase in the song that says, your presence comforts my soul. And I think sometimes when we're in distress, we got to coach our soul. We got to sing even though the soul is like mm. and so if you can't sing today i'll sing for you or the person next to you will sing for you but i want you to know that god is with you that he hasn't forgotten you and he'll always be with you never leaving you we're going to learn this song together it's called with you In 
I'm lost in your mystery. I'm found in your love for me. I just want to be here with you. I was told that one moment in God's presence could change my life. And every moment in God's presence has changed my life. That's the opportunity you have today as we sing. So let all that I am be consumed with who you are. All the glory of your presence. And what more could I ask for? So let all that I am be consumed with who you are. All the glory of your presence. What more could I ask for? So let Thank you, Jesus. Can we be real with our Heavenly Father and say thank you? Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for my sickness. Thank you for my health. Thank you for your presence because it changes my life. It wrecks my world. You are good, God. Thank you for the cancer that sits in my body. Thank you for being you. I want to let you know that there's nothing better than Jesus. If you're looking for a way out, there's nothing better than Jesus. I'm going to sing this. That's part of a song that says, oh, there's nothing better than you. Can you sing it? And oh, there's nothing better than you. And there's nothing, no, and better than you. There's nothing, and nothing is better than you. Come on, can we lift our voice in this place and say, oh, there's nothing, no, and better than you. There's nothing, God, and better than you. There's nothing, and nothing is better than you. Let's sing that one more time. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing, and better than you. There's nothing, and better than you. There's nothing, Jesus, and nothing is better than you 
You guys believe that with us this morning? Oh, yeah, he's good. Come on. It's about to get loud in here, church, so I suggest we wake up. You guys ready? And I search the world. Come on, in confidence we say. But it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fail are never enough. church you turn my morning Shame into glory, and 
Man, I love you. I love leading you into a place where we can experience God's presence together. I know you guys are a little bit quiet, but I still love you. You guys can have a seat where you're at. We'll be right with you, okay? I love you. Hey, hey, I came out to introduce our guest pastor for today. I know he is privileged, him and his wife, Rosie, up here in the front. It's my beautiful aunt right there. But I am privileged to call him uncle and aunt. And here is my uncle, Juan de la Garza. Can you guys help me welcome him in? Come on, church. Love you guys. Buenos dias. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Kind of chilly out there, huh? Well, I think it's better today than yesterday and the day before yesterday. So I'm excited that we got a good day to be able to come to church today. And I'm excited to be here after, I think I was here about maybe, what, four or five weeks ago? Uh, so I'm happy to be back, excited to be back. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm always excited to preach. That's my calling, that's what I do, that's what I've been doing for the last 50 years, and I'm always excited to get behind this pulpit, and I want to thank Pastor Ellie, I know that he's under the weather right now, I want to thank him for the opportunity, uh, we just want you to know, Ellie, that we're praying for you, my wife and I are praying for you, and I'm sure the church is praying for you, for your quick recovery, but again, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for this opportunity. My wife of over 40 years is here with me. Rosie, after 40 years, <clears throat> after 40 years, you don't say, you don't, you don't want to go longer than 40. So after 40 years, I just quit talking about anniversaries, okay? So it's been over 40 years. She's been a, an incredible woman, uh, very, very special, very supportive. Most of you already know her, and uh, she's just special all, all around. It was her birthday yesterday, and uh, uh, every time she gets a birthday and I get a birthday, we get excited. We get excited. Well, again, I just want to say that I'm excited to be here. I want to share something that it's very, very uh, much in my heart, and I know that this is going to speak to many of you. I know that there's somebody here that is going to identify with the message. Uh, so let me go ahead and give you the title and let me go ahead and give you the scripture. So if you have your Bibles, please go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 17 through 30. Daniel, chapter 3, 
verses 17 through 30. I'm not going to read the whole uh, story because most of you, if not all of you, already know the story. But I'll be touching on some verses there. Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 through 30. And the title, my topic for this morning is, There's No Promotion Without a Process. There is no promotion without a process. Uh, nobody likes to go through process. Nobody wants to go through a process, period. But listen, if we don't go through a process, there is no promotion. So if you want to be promoted, and I'm talking spiritually and in all areas, if you want to be promoted, you're going to have to go through a process. And I will speak about that because I know that some of you, maybe some of you online are going through a process. Not only you don't like to go through a process, I don't like to go through a process, but it's very hard to understand process. Very, very hard. I mean, if you, if you study the Bible slowly, you're going to find out about that. So this morning, let's go ahead and read the scriptures here. Uh, I'm going to read about two, three verses, and then I'll jump into the message. Verse 17. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego speaking, the God that we serve is able to deliver us. How many of you know that God can deliver us from any process? I mean, our God can deliver us from anything. We just heard the song right now. Our God is a God of the mountain, but also he's the God of the valleys. Okay? So this is what they're saying. If we are thrown into the blazing fire, uh, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. But then it says, and if he will deliver us from your majesty's hands, but even if he doesn't, nobody likes to read that part. But even if he doesn't, what's going to happen if he doesn't? What's going to happen if I get sick? And I don't get healed. Am I going to continue serving God? What's going to happen if I go through some kind of a cancer? And God does not deliver me. Am I going to continue serving God? What's going to happen if I go through a major trial in my family? What if God doesn't deliver me? What's going to be my response? And this is what they're saying. If God does not deliver us from this fire, we're going to go through the process. We're going to allow God to pass us through the process. So guess what happened here? They were not delivered. Every time God does not deliver us, we raise our heads to, towards heaven and ask the popular question, God, where are you? Or where were you when I needed you the most? Let me share seven things with you. I'm sure that I'm not going to be able to finish this message, but let me share seven things with you. Real quickly here. Number one, when God doesn't deliver you from a trial, he personally goes into the fire with you. I want you to listen to that. When he does not deliver you, he will personally go into the fire with you. That's a little bit hard to understand. 
But this is exactly what happened here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not delivered. But guess what? The fourth man was in the fire. In other words, God got into the fire with them. Let me, let me be a little bit more personal here. And uh, let me share a story with you. You haven't heard it before. I've shared this in many, many, many other churches. But 14 years ago, I went through an open heart surgery. 14 years ago. Uh, I remember the night before surgery. I was laying down at the hospital. Rosie was there with me, of course. And I looked, at the, I, I looked into her eyes. She was a little bit nervous. I was nervous. The family was nervous. Everybody was nervous. Church was nervous. And uh, this is what I said to her. I said, Rosie, if God does not deliver me, if God does not heal me between now, it was about 6 o'clock, between now and 6 o'clock in the morning, God is going to pass us through a process. I said that to her around 6 o'clock that evening. Well, 12 hours later, nothing happened. God didn't heal me. Even though I am a firm believer of miracles. The Bible teaches about miracles. In fact, I had a, I had a, 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 a program on the radio that was called the hour of power. And I would speak a lot about being delivered from, from whatever. Sicknesses and whatever. But God didn't deliver me. So at 6 o'clock in the morning, I was taken into surgery. A few hours later, I came out. I was okay, according to the doctors. Even though I went cold blue twice when I was in the hospital. But I remember one night when I felt that I wasn't going to make it. I remember calling the nurse, very sweet girl, Christian girl. I called her up, and she came. I couldn't even, I could hardly talk. I had all these wires all over me, and I remember asking her a question. I said, listen, could I speak to my wife? And she smiled at me, and she said, yes. And, of course, I thought she was going to bring my wife to the room. She didn't. She brought me a phone. And she said, she's on the line. This was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I got the phone. And the best way I could communicate with her, I said, listen, I don't feel good. I don't think I'm going to make it. Can you please pray for me? You, you have to understand that we've been prayer partners for a long time. Every night we go out in our car and we pray every single night. So this is my prayer partner here, and I'm asking for prayer because I knew and I felt in my heart that I wasn't going to make it. That's how bad I was. And she started praying for me. After she prayed for me, I said, good night. And the lady came and picked up the phone, and I said to the girl, Listen, can I ask you, can I ask you a question? I know you're a Christian and I know that you know that I'm a pastor. Is there anyone, 
Is there anyone in this floor that can personally come to my room and pray for me? She smiled at me and she responded real quickly and she said, I know the perfect person. She said, can you be by yourself for a little while? I said, yes, go ahead and bring that person. So she walked out. I'm laying down. The room is kind of dark like this one here. I can't see much. I can only see the door. And I can see little things moving around me. But I was all wired up. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody walked into my room. I'm going to say she was a she because of her voice. But she came to my right hand and she tapped me and she said these words. Pastor, you're going to be okay. You know, how, you, you know how that feels when somebody comes into your room and says, you're going to be okay when you know that you're dying? Because I felt that night that I was going to die. And she said, you're going to be okay. And the, my only response was, can you pray for me? She said, I came to pray for you. And then she started praying. My God, I had never heard that kind of a prayer. I mean, you're talking about a prayer warrior here. The lady is going around in circles around my, <clears throat> around my bed, and she's praying and praying, and she's loud. She's loud. I don't know about you, but there's certain prayers that you can feel. I felt this one. I felt it. And as she continued praying and praying and praying and praying, and finally she finished, came back again on my right shoulder, and she said the same words, you're going to be okay. I was trying to touch her hand trying to touch her to say thank you. But she didn't allow me to say that, say thank you, or to touch her. And she started walking out. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the peace that it's hard to explain was all over couldn't explain the peace. I mean, I felt the prayer. I felt the peace. I felt God all over the place. And I said, oh my God, what just happened? As I was going through that feeling, I was wiping my tears. The nurse started walking in. And I went like this. And she goes, I said, thank you. Thank you. So she started walking to where I was. And as she got closer to me, I said, thank you. And she said, for what? I said, thank you for the nurse that you sent to my room. <sighs> These are her words. Pastor, I'm very sorry I couldn't find her. I couldn't find the nurse. 
I said, oh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm touching myself. I'm thinking, I'm alive. I'm, I'm still alive. I said, the nurse came into my room and she said that I was going to be okay. And she smiled at me and she said, Pastor, I think you need to rest. I said, no, I think you need to listen to me. There was a nurse in my room. She just left my room. She came again and she said, you need to rest. Tomorrow you're going to leave this room and your wife is going to be waiting for you. Try to rest. I insisted that there was a nurse that came into my room and this is what she said. How is she dressed? I said, well, the way every nurse dresses. She was dressed in white. She smiled again and she said, nobody dresses in white in this room. I said, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. She said, That night, an angel came into my room. That's what happened. That was confirmed the next day. When I woke up the next day, I knew that I was going to be okay. In fact, from that night on, I knew that I was going to be okay. God didn't deliver me from surgery. He came with me into surgery. He didn't deliver me from the process. He came in into the process. Into the into the process and guarantee me that I was going to be okay. So number one, please understand that every time you go through a process, a godly process, understand, please understand if he doesn't deliver you, he hasn't left you. He's walking right next with you. How many of you can believe that? He's walking right next to you. And that was my experience at the hospital. So when people ask me about the hospital, my experience at the hospital, my process in the hospital, my sickness in the hospital, my open heart surgery in the hospital, I, 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 I try very hard to tell them, hey, it wasn't as bad. Because I... I mean, be honest, be honest. How many of you have prayed that an angel will walk into your room in one of those prayer nights that you've had through the years? Well, he never did until I was in that process. Listen, church, that's God's commitment. That's God, God's commitment. I will be with you all the days of your life. That's his commitment. Not necessarily he has to, the responsibility to send an angel. He might send an angel. But if he doesn't, that doesn't mean that he's not going to be there with you. Okay, I said I had seven points. I'm on number one, okay? And I don't know how much time I have till 12, right? 
Number two, if God delivers you, listen, if God delivers you before the process, you will never be promoted to the level or dimension that God has planned for you. How many of you know that God has plans for you? But who wants to go through the process? Who wants to go through the process? Nobody likes to go through the process. Nobody likes that season of life. Nobody enjoys the process. But when you go to the Bible again, you see Abraham going through a process. You see Jacob going through a process. You see Isaac going through a process. You see Joseph the dreamer going through a process. Every single person that you read about in the Bible, they went through a process. That process brought promotion. It's like going to school. It's like going to school. In order for you to jump into the next grade, you need a test. No test, no promotion. So here you find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through a process. And at the closing of the story, you're going to see that they were promoted according to the scriptures. But they went through a process. But again, nobody likes the process. Nobody, nobody, I don't care who you are. Nobody likes the process. It's like I want to wake up and finish high school. I want to wake up and finish college. I want to wake up and be doing, having a job. It doesn't happen like that. So process is part of the promotion. Number three, those things that you see as a crisis, God sees them as a promotion. Oh, pastor, I'm going, through a pro I'm going through a crisis right now. You know what? After 50 years in ministry and 40-some years in marriage, I have a family, I have a church, I have a ministry. <laughs> I've learned, and this is not easy to say, but it's easy for me. After 50 years in ministry, I found out that nothing that happens to me Nothing that happens to me has the, reason, the purpose to destroy me. Nothing. But again, every time you go through a process, whether it's family, whether it's finances, whether it's school, whether it's job, whatever you go through, it's always painful. Nobody likes to go through pain. Nobody enjoys pain. But again... Everything has a reason and everything has purpose and everything will promote you eventually. Some of you might be rebelling the process. And every time you rebel, it just makes it a little bit longer. Remember the Israelites in the, in the wilderness? The trip that was supposed to take 11 days took them 40 years. Why? Why? Because they rebel every time. And every time they rebel, God would say, okay, another, another turn. Another turn. We're going to make it longer. You don't want to learn? We'll make it longer. Okay, son, if you don't learn, another trip. Another round. That happened to the Israelites for 40 years. But again, nobody likes the process. But the process has a purpose. Everything that you go through has a purpose. Pastor, but I don't understand. God didn't call you to understand. God called you to obey. You'll never be able to understand everything that happens in life. I mean, I wish I could understand certain things. 
Now I just bow my heads and I say, God, I don't understand this, but I know that you have a reason, you have a purpose for this, and I'm going to submit to it. That's what I do. I submit to God. Because eventually, I will find out that God was right. Number four, trials that come from God do not have the purpose to destroy, but to elevate, to build you. Every time you go through a trial, every time you go through a problem, God has the purpose to build you, to elevate you. Number five, trials that come from God do not have the purpose to take away, but to add into your life. Number six, trials that come from God do not have the purpose to discourage you, but to lift you. I mean, just think about it. If we could just obey, instead of rebelling against God through the process, just obey. And again, let me repeat this. You don't have to, and you, will ne you don't have to understand everything because you never will. Understand everything. I remember when we came from Mexico back in the early 60s. I mean, we had big dreams. I was the oldest. I was about 11 or 12. Everybody else was much younger. And uh, I remember my dad and my mom saying that we were moving to the U.S. and we didn't understand that. But I guess they had dreams and not so much for them but for us. And uh, I remember that in, I, I think, I, I believe it was in the first or second year that we came across, one of my brothers died. I remember that night like as if it was today. Man, that was painful. He was only 10 years old. Very painful. One of those things that is very, very hard to grasp, very hard to understand. But I went through that at a very young age. I remember being angry, being upset. In fact, I said, when I grow up, I'm, I'm going to go kill that doctor and that nurse. That's how upset I was. But let me say something here to you. The death of my brother changed my dad. I know it changed my mom, but I, it changed my dad because I noticed I was, I was already 11 and 12 years old. I, I could see, I could understand. Because of the death of my brother that I couldn't understand or not anybody in the family could understand, because of that, my dad's commitment to God was unquestionable from that day forth. And because of his commitment to God, because of how much he gave to God after that experience, I, I, I never asked him what happened to you after my brother's death, I never asked him that question. I just knew that something happened to him and his level of commitment was way up there. And because of his commitment, now there's preachers in the family. Now there's committed people in the family. Now there's singers in the family. Now there's deacons in the family. Now there's laymen in the family. Now there's people that are preaching all over the place because of that. I never asked him. I never did. I wish I, I had, but I never did. But I know that his level of commitment grew because of that trial. Sometimes trial, trials can do that. They'll change your way of seeing things. So trials don't have a purpose. The purpose of a trial is not to destroy you. It's always to build you, to edify you, to elevate you. 
So if you're going through a trial right now and you're trying to understand, listen, don't try to understand. Just submit and obey. You'll be better off like that. That's what I've done every time. And it's paid off. Let me just wrap it up with one more thing. <sighs> Trials that come from God do not have the purpose to kill, but to give life. Trials that come from God does not have the purpose to kill you, but to give you life. So just kind of wrapping it up here, there's three things that I wanted to mention, but I'll mention real quickly here so we can wrap it up. Uh, remember when the disciples were sent across the sea and there was a storm on the way over? Where was Jesus? Where, where was Jesus in the middle of the storm? The Bible says that Jesus was sleeping in the boat. So it doesn't matter what kind of a storm you're going through. I want you to know that Jesus is there. Remember Paul being sent to Rome? And there was a furious, furious storm on the way over. Where was God in that storm? Well, the Bible says that the angel of God came into the storm. So he was always there. Remember Jeremiah? In prison? Yes, he was in prison. And the Bible says, and God came for the second time to talk to him. In prison. So just in closing here, whether you're going, I mean, it don't matter what you're going through. I just want you to understand that God is with you. You might not see it. You might not understand it. But God is with you. That's his commitment. But pastor, I'm hurting here. Listen, God is with you. But pastor, things are not looking too good with my son. Listen, God is with you. Pastor, but you don't understand my family. Listen, God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. What do I have to do? Pastor, well, we need to understand process. Because that's another thing that I've learned. Process is not forever. And trials are not forever. You'll get out of it. And one of these days, whatever trial you went through one of these days it's going to be your testimony but whatever you're going through remember I was in the hospital yes now that's a powerful testimony every time I share that testimony people go oh my God an angel of God came into your room yes but guess what I was I was dying so whatever you're going through right now it's going to be your testimony that's going to be your book of tomorrow So accept, trials are real, but God is more real. Can I pray for you? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity, Father, to be able to share my heart with all heart children. I thank you, Father, for allowing us to just open our mouths and be able to say, you are good. And it doesn't matter what we go through, you are going to go with us. We might, go, we might be going through pain right now, but God, you're with us. We might be hurting right now, but you're with us. We might not understand what we're going through right now, but you're with us. Thank you. Father, thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for sending Jesus. 
Thank you for your comforter, your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. How many of you received the word this morning? You received that? that, does, that does that speak to your heart? Thank you so much. I don't know who's in charge here now. Am I supposed to just walk out or what do I do here? Just walk out? Okay. Thank you. God bless you.